Welcome to Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series is a very interesting one entitled Making Friends for God, The Joy of Sharing His Mission. And this is lesson number five in that series entitled Spirit Empowered Witnessing. That's the lesson for August 1 of 2020. And as usual, we'd like to ask you to bow your heads with us as we pray to start. Our kind and wonderful Father, as always, we are thankful for your presence and your guidance and your care for us. We especially now ask that you will guide us as we talk about how the Spirit might work with us and through us and give us guidance as we reach out to others. May that be the experience of many having read this series of lessons and studied them together is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Have you ever been asked to do something that was really impossible? How, would you, how did you respond? I remember when I was a kid, kids used to like to say, what happens when the irresistible force meets the, meets the immovable object? <laughs> Some of you will remember <laughs> talking like that. Uh, this is what we're talking about. So how did you respond? Imagine Jesus telling his 11 remaining disciples that they were to carry the gospel to the entire world. Try to imagine how that would hit you. What is not mentioned there is that Jesus was going to give them an extraordinary helper. To accomplish the task, the Holy Spirit would be their motivation and their assistant. The Holy Spirit was to make their witness effective in everything they did. Later, it was reported in Acts 17, 6, that these early believers, open quote, turned the world upside down, close quote. That's from the New King James Version. That was a statement, in fact, by one of their enemies. Their enemies are saying they've turned the world upside down. Even later, Paul said that the gospel was preached to every creature under heaven, Colossians 1, 23. So, our study for today is, how was all that accomplished? Well, with the right message and the right spirit, the Holy Spirit, working with us, could we turn the world upside down in our day? Think of all the technology we have available to us that they didn't have. I mean, Paul, when he wanted to take the gospel to the next city or the next town, he had to walk over there. There is certainly no hesitancy on God's part, on the Spirit's part, and He has given the power to get the job. He's, he has the power to get the job done. Well, we should constantly keep in mind the fact that God could send angels to appear as human beings and do the job without our help. He could do that. But that is not God's plan. We need the experience of participating with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in spreading the gospel. So they wait for us to do our part. Our part might be fairly small, but it's an essential part. So, have you ever had the experience of actually feeling the activity of the Holy Spirit as you sought to witness to someone? This happens to me all the time. I find out when I sometimes have classes like this one for TV or teach a Sabbath school class at the church that it comes out a lot better than I even thought it could. People are comment, they bring ideas and so forth, and the final result seems to be something greater than I could have imagined. And I have to believe that that's the Holy Spirit doing his activity. Well, remember also that God would love to reach, and the Holy Spirit would love to reach and convert every single person on this earth. He prepares people's hearts even before we speak to them. So Jesus himself gave us these promises. Jim? John 15, 26 and, 20, and 27. The Helper will come, the Spirit, who re reveals the truth about God and who comes from the Father. I will send him to you from the Father, and he will speak about me. And you, too, will speak about me because you have been with me from the very beginning. American Bible Society, 1992, Holy Bible. John 16, 8. And when he came, he, he excuse me, and when he comes, he will prove to the people of the world that they were wrong about sin and about what is right and about God's judgment. Good news, Bible. So, 
Remember that the Holy Spirit's job is to direct us in making known to other beings the truth about God and about Jesus. So the truth is not about us. The, you know, our story may be convincing sometimes, but that's not the real issue. The real issue is we are supposed to help God make the truth about God and about Jesus Christ effective. So how does that cooperative effort actually work? Do we need the Holy Spirit to open our eyes to see the responsibilities for witnessing? Shouldn't we be praying for that every day? So if we are not witnessing, does that mean that we are not fully Christian? Hmm. What is, it that, what is it that the Holy Spirit would like us to most clearly understand and teach to others? Well, let's think about our mission. Seventh-day Adventists have always claimed that the three angels' messages are our messages to the world in the final days of this earth's history. And if you've been in the church for a while, you must know that. What is it that we can say about the three angels' messages that is unique? Well, in order to correctly represent the three angels' messages, we must have a good understanding of the great controversy in the context of all of Scripture. And if we try to witness without being as prepared as we can be, will the Holy Spirit still help us? Well, if you read through the book of Acts and consider all the wonderful things that it describes, you might agree with many scholars who have called it not the Acts of the Apostles, but the Acts of the Holy Spirit. So what did the Holy Spirit do for the Apostles that got them started on this work? And here's an incredible comment. Kerry? There were dwelling at Jerusalem Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. And that's Acts 2.5. I think, how's that? Yeah, didn't look right. During the dispersion of the Jews had been scattered to almost every part of the inhabited world. And in their exile, they had learned to speak various languages. Many of these Jews were on this occasion in Jerusalem attending the religious festivals then in progress. Every known tongue was represented by those assembled. This diversity of languages would have been a great hindrance to the proclamation of the gospel. God therefore in a miraculous manner supplied the deficiency of the apostles. The Holy Spirit did for them that which they could not have accomplished for themselves in a lifetime. They could now proclaim the truths of the gospel abroad, speaking with accuracy the languages of those for whom they were laboring. This miraculous gift was a strong evidence to the world that their commission bore the signet of heaven. Wow. From this time forth, the language of the disciples was pure, simple, and accurate, whether they spoke in their native tongue or in a foreign language. That comes from Ellen G. White's The Acts of the Apostles, page 39, paragraph 240. Well, there can be no doubt that the Holy Spirit was with them. Could this happen in our day? Think about that. I mean, there are now 6,000 languages spoken in our world. I worked in East Africa. There were 120 different languages or dialects. In Tanzania, there was something about 70 in Kenya. I mean, just imagine the challenge of trying to spread the gospel to all those people. Now, of course, you know, those nations would require that a, a single language be the national language, and so most people could, could speak that to a certain degree. But uh, amazing situation. I, I think God is going to have to do that again. He's got somehow or other. Well, we know the story about what happened. Peter got up and preached on the day of Pentecost, and 3,000 people wanted to be baptized. How many big places to baptize people are there in the, in the city of Jerusalem? I wouldn't think too much. None. Yeah. I don't know whether they baptized them later in another spot or whether they went down to the Pool of Siloam where you could probably get maybe 10 or 15 people in at a time. <clears throat> uh, that was the city water supply. Um, and then all these people would gather together in the temple courtyard. Think about this. The temple courtyard right there under the noses of the Sanhedrin, they gathered there and then they would scatter out to eight meals in individual homes. 
Now, who prepared all that food? Diana, how would you like to prepare for 6,000 people? <laughs> Amazing. Were there other times when the Holy Spirit came down just as he had at Pentecost? When Peter came back to Jerusalem after his experience with Cornelius and his family, Peter knew at, by the time he left Joppa to head up to Cornelius's place, he knew there was going to be a fight when he got back to Jerusalem. So he took six other Christians with him, Jewish Christians with him, up there to Cornelius's place. So when he got back, he said, okay, you guys, you have to come with me to Jerusalem because I know what's going to happen when I get to Jerusalem. So when Peter finally got back to Jerusalem, he recounted the story of what happened. They, they said, you know, what were you doing? What were you thinking? Going into the house of a Gentile and eating with him? Hmm. Well, so there could be no question about the truthfulness of the account. Peter had six witnesses from the church in Joppa to confirm his story. And then what happened? Acts 11, 15 to 18 tells us, And when I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came down on them just as on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. It is clear that God gave those Gentiles the same gift that he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I then to stop, try to stop God? Can I interrupt for just a second? I mean, how could, you, how could you argue with that? You know, God sends the Holy Spirit down. These people are obviously receiving the Holy Spirit. He has all the witnesses there. They received the Holy Spirit just like we did at Jerusalem. Okay, what are you going to say now? <laughs> Nothing else to say. <laughs> Go ahead. When they heard this, they stopped their criticism and praised God, saying, Then God has given to the Gentiles also the opportunity to repent and live. Amazing. Well, so you know what I'm going to ask you next. Did Cornelius and his family begin to spread the gospel as the disciples were doing? And in any language, did they have the gift of tongues? I knew they were. I'm not sure about the gift of tongues, but probably did. I know it says they received the Holy Spirit just like the apostles. That's what it says there. Yeah. That's a question for you out there. What do you think? Well, moving on with the story, I'm going now to Acts 19, verses 1 through 7. Another occasion. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior of the province and arrived in Ephesus. There he found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? How did they respond? We have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit, they answered. Well then, what kind of baptism did you receive, Paul asked. The baptism of John, they answered. Paul said, the baptism of John was for those who turned from their sins, which is certainly appropriate. And he told the people of Israel to believe in the one who was coming after him, that is, in Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Holy Spirit. Now, I assume that was a second water baptism? I suppose. Paul placed his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came down upon them. They spoke in strange tongues and also proclaimed God's message. They were about 12 men in all. Good news Bible. So does that mean they also could speak all the languages? Sounds like it. Makes you wonder, doesn't it? Yeah. <laughs> so do we know exactly how and when Paul received the Holy Spirit? Now he's giving it out. How did he, when did he receive it? Was it at his, on that Damascus Road trip? Was it somewhere out in the desert where he went next? We don't know. We know that it was the custom of the, in Bible times not only to count everyone who came to a gathering. Instead, uh, when we know that it was a custom in Bible times not to count everyone who came to a gathering. Instead, only to count the men. That seems to have been true when counting the number of baptisms in Acts two forty one and four four as well. That was an enormous number of baptisms in Acts two forty one and four four. As, um, that was an enormous number of people who joined the church in a relatively short period of time. Acts 5.14 suggests that many more also joined. I mean, I, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees in Jerusalem must have been wringing their hands. I mean, how could they respond to that kind of a thing? They probably hadn't thought too much about it up to that time. 
Well, it's important to notice another aspect of this explosive growth in the early Christian church. Some really important stories involved single individuals, like Lydia, the Philippian jeweler and his uh, jailer, I'm sorry, and his family, the demon-possessed slave girl in Philippi, the Ethiopian eunuch. You can think of those stories if you're familiar with the New Testament and the book of Acts. Why do you suppose that God went to such extraordinary lengths to reach a single individual such as he did for the Ethiopian eunuch? I mean, what did he have to do to get to that Ethiopian eunuch? He grabbed Philip out of Samaria, carried him probably, I don't know, 50 to 75 miles, must have been the first airplane trip, and dropped him down there on the road going down from Jerusalem to Gaza, just at the right time, and there's the Ethiopian eunuch trying to read the Bible and trying to figure out what's going on. At exactly the right time. Um, wow. So uh, Jewish tradition required that if there were at least 10 families in a given town, village, or city, they had to establish a synagogue. This idea was apparently carried over to Christian thinking and would have required many gathering places for Christians to come together. We know almost nothing about those gathering places if they were separate. We do know that many often met in people's homes. Remember, Christianity was what kind of religion in those days? It was in homes. It was about under, underground, wasn't it? It was an underground religion. It was an illegal religion based on the Roman, the Roman government. Yeah. We do know that, um, the very early Christian groups met in the temple courtyard in Jerusalem. Imagine the explosive growth of that Christian group meeting right under the noses of the mm -hmm. Sanhedrin. Amazing. Uh, well, um, look at some of these passages, Acts 7.55. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw God's glory and Jesus standing at the right-hand side of God. Look, he said. You know, you get here, you're getting ready to throw a stone at him, to kill him. And he says, look. I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing on the right-hand side of God, and you're going, huh? Yeah. I mean, amazing stories. Uh, let me pick another one. Let's go to 1115. And when I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came down on them just as at the, be at the beginning. We just looked at that. That's the story of Peter. Um, what different things did the Holy Spirit do on those occasions to help in the spreading of the gospel? Think of Stephen looking up to heaven as he was being stoned and, give, and seeing Jesus standing at the right side of God. Remember how Philip was guided miraculously to the carriage of the Ethiopian eunuch. Look what God did to get Peter to reach out to Cornelius and his family. But you can be sure that even in those days, the devil was so exasperated because of the success of the life and even the death of Jesus that he was determined to do everything he could to prevent this new church from getting started. At the first so-called general conference session, mentioned in Acts 15, they concluded with some interesting rules. I want you to tell me what you, what you think about these rules. Acts, Acts, 15, Acts 15, 28 and 29. The Holy Spirit and we have agreed not to put any other burden on you besides their, these necessary rules. Eat no food that has been offered to the idols. Eat no blood Eat no animal that has been strangled, and keep yourselves from sexual immorality. You will do well if you take care not to do any of these things with our best wishes. wishes. Good News Bible. Wow. So why were these rules necessary? We don't necessarily need to tell people not to do something if they aren't, they aren't already doing it. So. Okay. <laughs> and what would that imply? Well, that's the, what they were doing. They were eating uh, yes. ba bad food and, and offered uh, food that had been offered to idols, and they were in, into whatever their sexual but, proclivities were. Yeah, okay, and, and they were not supposed to do that. Absolutely, I agree. But the, uh, there's an additional thing that, that was involved in giving these rules. Christians were expected, Christian groups were supposed to be gathering with Jews and Gentiles coming together and worshiping together. And the Jews, even though they were Christians now, if they knew a Gentile was doing all these things, they would refuse to even be in the same building. Yeah. So you couldn't meet together as a group if some people were doing these things. 
So this wasn't, these aren't rules for our salvation. It was so that the Jews would not consent or would consent to even get, a cl get close to or sit beside the Gentiles included in the worship or at meals. I mean, it's pretty amazing that Christians would agree to meet with Gentiles at all. I mean, Jewish Christians. Do you think about the clean fish? That's a form of strangulation, isn't it? You know, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's, it's kind of on the edge, isn't it? I yeah, okay. I mentioned in the sermon. Go ahead, Gary. Acts 16. Okay. Acts 16, verse... Talking about Paul, and and uh, this was... Uh, this was uh, Silas this time, yeah. Acts 16, verses 6 to 12. They traveled through the region of Phrygia and Galatia because the Holy Spirit did not let them preach the message in the province of Asia. When they reached the border, uh, the border rather, of Mysia, they tried to go into the province of Bithynia. But the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So they traveled right on through Mysia and went to Troas. That night Paul had a vision in which he saw a Macedonian standing and begging him, Come over to Macedonia and help us. As soon as Paul had this vision, we got ready to leave for Macedonia because we decided that God had called us to preach the good news to the people there. And that's the good news Bible. I want you to notice something very interesting there. In the first part of this passage says, Paul went here, he did this, he wasn't allowed to go here, he wasn't allowed to go there. And I want to ask, well, let's, let's ask first of all this question. What, uh, how, how does Jesus prevent you from going somewhere? Why would God do that? The Holy Spirit did not let them preach the message in the province of Asia. The Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. What's going on there? Maybe they forgot the language. Maybe there was uh, fighting up on the road somewhere. To avoid it. Yeah, well, that's a possibility. I think probably the big, prob big situation was that the Holy Spirit wanted them to go to Europe and get on with the gospel there. I I'm pretty sure that was the major reason. But we get down to verse 10. It says, as soon as Paul had this vision, we got ready to leave for Macedonia because we decided that God had called us to preach the good news to the people there. So why all of a sudden the change in pronouns? Anybody have an idea? Well, how do you suppose the Holy Spirit was actually guiding Paul on those occasions? How did he prevent Paul from going into the province of Asia and later the province of Bithynia? What we know is that Paul traveled on to the city of Troas. It was there that he met Dr. Luke. Dr. Luke joined Paul's group at that point and followed Paul for most of the rest of Paul's life. Imagine a, t a tenor preacher comes through. And Paul, I mean, Luke must have had probably a successful business there in Troas uh, as a physician. And he just attaches himself to Paul and wherever Paul went, there was Luke. Amazing. So, as a result of these few stories that we have just mentioned, the Christian message was taken to the continent of Africa and to the continent of Europe. God wanted the message to spread like wildfire. wildfire. Well, we may not be given the responsibility of carrying the gospel to a new continent for the first time. In spreading the gospel, the power of the Holy Spirit is nonetheless effective in our day. Try to imagine how exciting it would be if everyone in our Sabbath school class was out witnessing in some way every week and could come back with marvelous stories of the work of the Holy Spirit on the following Sabbath. Do you think that's a possibility? Could that actually happen? I think here and there it does. There are some countries that we're just now entering and uh, not so much the language is initially, but they're dreaming. Mm -hmm. And they're told, when such and such a person comes, you go. And this kind of thing. Yeah. It's starting there in some of these places. Yeah, yeah we're, the, the Adventist Church is reaching out to some places that yeah. we have never been to before. It's yeah. pretty remarkable. In each of these stories, it is important to notice that the message that was carried to the new believers was from God's Word. 
This was not a matter of individuals telling about some unusual things that happened to them as people. They were carrying the Spirit-inspired Word and sharing it with those who needed to hear it. So what is the most important work of the Holy Spirit? There is no question that the most important work of the Holy Spirit in the history of our world has been the giving of our Bible to the various authors. In other words, he's the one who inspired the individual authors to write the scriptures, um, as well as the preservation of those documents down through the generations with the copying and the translation being done accurately. As a result, today we have God's Word to hold in our hands. It was all done under the direction and guidance of the Holy Spirit. Diana? Acts 4, 4 and 31. But many who heard the message believed, and the number of men grew to about 5,000. When they finished praying, the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to proclaim God's message with boldness. Okay, now I just in passing, I want you to notice. We know that at Pentecost, there were how many people filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, at least the apostles. Sometime, some people read the passage and say, well, maybe there were up to 120 of people who were there witnessing. So maybe 120 people received the Spirit. How many received the Spirit here? 5,000. 5,000 people. Can wow. be done. It can be done. Acts 8, 4, the believers who were scattered went everywhere, preaching the message. Acts 11, 19 to 26, some of the believers who were scattered by the persecution which took place when Stephen was killed, went as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, telling the message to Jews only. But other believers who were from Cyprus, whoops, <laughs> Cyprus and Cyrene, which is Libya, went to Antioch and proclaimed the message to Gentiles also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's power was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. Okay. Well, that's an amazing story. Here we have, look at the sequence here. The persecution became really severe after this experience with Stephen. Stephen being stoned and immediately Paul and others were persecuting Christians. And Christians got scattered all over the place. And some of those Christians went to various countries. They went to uh, over to Cyrene. Now that's currently a place we call Libya. They went up to Antioch and so forth and, and started spreading the gospel. Well, uh, you know, as organizations tend to behave, what happened? Rumor got back to Jerusalem that lots of people were joining the church in Antioch. And they're saying, hold on, wait, wait, what is going on up there? And so guess what happened? Reading on, verse 22, the news about this reached the church in Jerusalem, so they sent Barnabas to Antioch. Okay? When he arrived and saw how God had blessed the people, he was glad and urged them all to be faithful and true to the Lord with all their hearts. Barnabas was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith, and many people were brought to the Lord. Then Barnabas went to Tarsus. Who do you know from Tarsus? Saul. Saul. Who became Paul. Who became Paul, exactly. And Tars from, from Antioch to Tarsus is just a relatively short distance. When he found him, he took him to Antioch, and for a whole year the two met with the people of the church and taught a large group. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Now, I have to interrupt for just a second and say, that wasn't intended to be a, a very special title. You, oh, you wonderful people, you're called Christians. No, they were, it was, it was supposed to be a mocking title. These are the people who are following a dead man. That's, that's, that was the claim. You people following that dead man, huh? What a funny bunch of people. Well, how's a dead man going to help you, you know? Okay. Um, Acts 18, 24 to 25 says, At that time a Jew named Apollos, who had been born in Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was an eloquent speaker and had a thorough knowledge of the Scriptures. He had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and with great enthusiasm he proclaimed and taught correctly. 
the facts about Jesus. However, he knew only the baptism of John. So has the Holy Spirit and the witness of Scripture had a significant impact on your life? What has it done, Tim? Second Peter 1.21 For no prophetic message ever came just from human will, but people were under the control of the Holy Spirit as, a, as they spoke and the messages that came from God. Hebrews 4.12 the Word of God is alive and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. It cuts all the way through to where soul and spirit meet, to where joints and marrow come together. It judges the desires and the thoughts of the heart. Good news Bible. What, what, what do you suppose that means, cuts all the way through to where the soul and spirit meet? What do you suppose oh, that, that means? It, it, <laughs> It's not diverted. It's it's focused on on that right. point. I th I would say. Well, and and to the people in that day, that would mean the very inside person. I mean, there's no you, you can't go any deeper into a person than that, right? Yep. And so Paul is saying, um, and I I believe Paul was the author of Hebrews. He probably had some help from Luke because the language. Yeah, the Greek and Hebrew sounds a lot more like Luke than it does like Paul. But the the the, the logic sounds like Paul. And he's saying, man, the, when the Holy Spirit comes, when the church really is on fire, that message goes all the way to the core of every single person. It'll be deep. Yep. Recognize the incredible challenges that the early church faced. The Holy Spirit did marvelous things, as recorded in the book of Acts. Think of the cultural biases that he overcame. I mean... Imagine taking the 12, those 11 disciples back in the beginning. Suppose Jesus had, right at the beginning, said, Okay, I want you to go to India. I want you to go to Samaria. I want you to go. He said, What are you talking about? We're Jews. We don't need to go out to reach those people. But now what are they doing? They're scattering to all those places. He, over, uh, he transformed lives, changing deeply ingrained habits. Meanwhile, he was gu guiding the teaching of the new people all the time about the wonderful story of Jesus. And again, I want you to think about this for a moment. A thousand people, or two thousand people, are gathered in the temple courtyard in Jerusalem. And the disciples are moving around among them, teaching about Jesus. And what was it that Paul, uh, I mean, sorry, that the, the Sanhedrin had told Peter and John before that about teaching about Jesus? They didn't really go for it. <laughs> they, they didn't. <laughs> okay, they didn't really go for it. They said, you must never, ever yeah. again try to teach in the name of Jesus. And now there's thousands of people gathered in the temple courtyard doing exactly what they were told they could not do. Mm -hmm. I mean, we need to think of all these you know, the full implications of the these dynamics things. that were yeah. going on. Amazing. The rabbis must have been having <laughs> all kinds of problems. Fading dead away or whatever. All kinds of thoughts. Wow. Um, we need to notice that the Holy Spirit meets people where they are, but he does not leave them there. He transforms our lives. Okay? So let's talk about what, what happened next. Look, look at a couple of passages. In Philippi, the conversion of Lydia. Um, actually, let me just go to that separately. We left by ship from Troas and sailed straight across to Samothrace and the next day to Neapolis. From there we went inland to Philippi, a city of the first district of Macedonia. It is also a Roman colony. Do you know what it means when we say a Roman colony? Probably on the edge of their territory somewhere there. No, no, no that's not what it means. Rome had a policy. That, of course, their idea was that they were going to spread their civilization to the whole world. Right. right. Well, you can't, you can't control everything that goes on in the whole world from one city. Mm -hmm. So when they would find a city they thought was appropriate in a right place and, and was would be influential city and the people were cooperative and so forth like this, they would actually send a group of retired Roman soldiers there mm -hmm. to establish a government there. And that city 
was treated as, as if it were a part of Rome itself. This is a Roman, it's a part of Rome. It may be way over there somewhere, but it's considered a, a part of Rome. And there, there were several places like that. Tarsus, where, where Paul was born and raised, was a Roman colony. Well, you can see it today even up in the northern part of England. Mm -hmm. There are colonies that they have, have unearthed where they have the barracks where the, where the soldier, you, the city had to maintain them. Well, on the Sabbath, he goes on to say, we went out of the city of the riverside where we thought that there would be a place where Jews gathered for prayer. So why is he doing that? Where is this? Why would he be going, looking out along the river, looking for Jews? Where should he find the Jews on Sabbath morning? Synagogue. Yeah. So apparently there wasn't any synagogue okay. in Philippi. We have to conclude there was no there was no synagogue in Philippi, so he said, "Well, maybe if there's just a few Jews, maybe they meet out by the riverside." And what happened? We sat down and talked to the women who gathered there. One of those who heard us was from Lydia, was Lydia from Thyatira, who was a dealer in purple cloth. She was, a, by the way, Lydia, Thyatira was famous for a very special kind of purple cloth. She was a woman who worshipped God, and the Lord opened her mind to pay attention to what Paul was saying. After she and the people of her house had been baptized, she invited us, Come and stay in my house, if you have decided that I am a true believer in the Lord, and she persuaded us to go. Now, I can tell you that if you have a, the opportunity to visit uh, Philippi uh, with a group of Christians, they will take you out to a place where there's actually a beautiful, two, two nice new chapels built there. Um, this, they believe, was a place where the women gathered and, and Paul met them. Right there, still you can find the place. Okay, and just to pick another one, 1733, some men, uh, and so Paul left the meeting. Some men joined him and believed among whom was Dionysius, a member of the council. There was also a woman named Damaris and some other people. And this was following Paul's speech at uh, Mars Hill in the Areopagus, uh, the, the ruling council of, of Athens. So you can see that, uh, you know, wherever go Paul goes, he's, he has an impact on people. I should, shouldn't say that. I should, the whole, should say the Holy Spirit had an impact on people. I think that's why Dr. Luke joined him. He knew mm -hmm. he was onto something there. Yep. Yeah. Well, what can and should we learn from these experiences of conversion in which Paul impacted the lives of people in very different social standings from the elite to the Areopagus to the leaders of synagogues? And by the way, I should, I should just mention that one. Look at this one. Crispus, who was the leader of the synagogue, but this is now in Corinth, believed in the Lord together with all his family and many other people in Corinth heard the message, believed and were baptized. I mean... Think of Paul. He arrives, he starts preaching the message in the synagogue, and the, the leading member of the synagogue decides to become a Christian. Yeah. Okay, well, Paul impacted the... Think of the people specifically mentioned. Lydia, a prosperous Jewish businesswoman. The Philippian jailer, a middle-class Roman civil servant. Uh, Dionysius, the Areopagite, Areopagite and others. You may look around you and your society and your culture and feel like it would be incredibly difficult to reach out to someone and see their life changed. Are you saying that this is beyond the Holy Spirit's ability? Remember that Christ died for everyone, not just for a small group of so-called Christians. Doesn't everyone deserve the right to hear about that marvelous sacrifice? Notice what Ellen White wrote about the work of the Holy Spirit. The lapse of time has wrought no change in Christ's uh, parting promise to send the Holy Spirit as his representative. It is not because of any restriction on the part of God that the riches of his grace do, riches of his grace do not flow earthward to men. If the fulfillment of the promise is not seen as it might be, it is because the promise is not appreciated as it should be. If all were willing, all would be filled with the Holy Spirit. Wherever the need of the Holy Spirit is a matter little thought of, there is seen spiritual drought. 
spiritual darkness, spiritual declension, and death. Wherever, whenever minor matters occupy the attention, the divine power which is necessary for the growth and prosperity of the church and which would bring all other blessings in its train is lacking, though offered in infinite plenitude. Acts of the Apostles, page 50, paragraph 1. <clears throat> Sin could be resisted and overcome only through the mighty agency of the third person of the Godhead, who would come with no modified energy, but in the fullness of divine power. It is the Spirit that makes effectual what, was, what has been wrought out by the world's Redeemer. It is by the Spirit that the heart is made pure. Through the Spirit, the believer becomes a partaker of the divine nature. Christ has given his Spirit as a divine power to overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil and to impress his own character upon his church. Desire of Ages 671. Wow. Is that really possible? To overcome all hereditary and cultivated tendencies to evil? What kind of tendencies to evil are not either cultivated or, or, or hereditary? That pretty much covers everything, doesn't it? Yeah. The very image of God is to be reproduced in humanity. The honor of God, the honor of Christ is involved in the perfection of the character of his people. Only those who wait humbly upon God, who watch for his guidance and grace, is the Spirit given. The power of God awaits their demand and reception. This promised blessing, claimed by faith, brings all other blessings in its train. That's uh, 672, the next page. Okay, so we've read some marvelous stories. We've, we've talked about people who've had incredible experiences in biblical times. Could that happen to us today? Could you as an individual Christian and Seventh-day Adventists do something to spread the truth about God? Well, you could pass out some literature. You could give a Bible study. I mean, we have lessons prepared. You just go and follow the lessons and, and, and share them with people. You could participate with others in a group to conduct an evangelistic effort. The Holy Spirit has many other ways in which you could work with Him if you just give Him an opportunity. How can we give the Holy Spirit an opportunity? Ask for it. Ask for it? There's a great, great idea. Any other ideas? I think basically, we just say, God, here I am. Use me. Do what you can. Do, do, do what you can. I'm your servant. You're not my servant. I'm your servant. You know what? The Holy Spirit would do things for us we, we, can't, we couldn't even imagine. I mean, look at the crazy things. Did, did Thomas have any idea at all, I'm sorry, Philip, have any idea at all that all of a sudden he's going to be whisked away to, down to the road to Gaza? Not a clue. Did Paul have any idea about what was going to happen to him as he's just about to get to Damascus? I mean, think of those stories. Well, what were the results of these stories? We know, we're, we've been reading about them. If so, share it with your Sabbath school class. Maybe you've had that kind of experience in your life. What prevents you from sharing your faith? Are you timid? Are you afraid? Do you think, well, I, I just couldn't do that. I, I'm, I'm, I'm too ignorant. Remember that if you're witnessing the Holy Spirit will be your guide. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't do any preparation. It means, it means we need to do what we can do, but the Holy Spirit will guide us. Spreading the gospel to people around the world is God's number one mission to accomplish before Jesus can come again. What does Matthew 24, 14 say? Remember? And this gospel of the kingdom shall be, preached. shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Okay? Uh, and when someone decides to leave his evil ways and become a Christian, remember that Luke 15, 7 and 10 tell us what, there's what? Do you remember? And the same way, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 respectable people who do not need to repent. 
And if you drop down to verse 10, in the same way, I tell you, the angels of God rejoice over one sinner who repents. I mean, try to imagine, how would you like to make heaven rejoice? Think about it. You could do something that would make heaven rejoice. To better understand exactly what Christ intended for the Holy Spirit to do, read John 14 to 16. Now, what's John 14 to 16? Those are, those are the final experiences, Jesus' final minutes with his disciples in the upper room before they went out to the Garden of Gethsemane and, you know, the rest of the story. So this is, I mean, they didn't know, but this was Jesus, well, he knew, this was his parting instructions to, the children, to, to his disciples. And that explains a portion of the events that happened in the upper room before Jesus and his disciples went out to the Garden of Gethsemane. We must always remember that the work of converting souls is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not our work. We're just cooperating. We're not the main force in that activity. Think about what you know about the disciples that Jesus chose to follow him. When they joined Jesus, they thought they would become members of his royal cabinet to rule the Jews from Jerusalem. Ah, we're going to be the big people now, right? We're going to have cabinet positions. I don't know what they called them in those days, but that's what we would call them today, right? But he was choosing them to spread the gospel to the world and to die as martyrs. What would you uh, say to your wife if you went home that day and said, uh, guess what, wife? I've just, been, I've just been asked to join Jesus, and he promised me that someday I'll be a martyr. <laughs> what would the wife say? Uh, Choose something else to yeah, do, yeah, right? She, she wouldn't be too happy, I don't think. I don't think she would have been too happy. So how were these men qualified for that work? Were they highly educated? Not originally, but they are educated by Christ. The first thing to be learned, now I'm going to quote from Desire of Ages again. The first thing to be learned by all who would become workers together with God is the lesson of self-distrust. You don't have to go out and say, I, I, I've got it all together, I know exactly what to do, I don't need the Holy Spirit's help, I'll just spread the gospel. No, we must learn, the first, what's the first lesson? Self-distrust. Then they are prepared to have imparted to them the character of Christ. This is not to be gained through education in the most scientific schools. It is a fruit of wisdom that is obtained from the divine teacher alone. So who's the only one that can pass, pass along that kind of wisdom? Jesus himself. Jesus chose, and here we go. Let's, let's talk about how Jesus chose his disciples. Jesus chose unlearned fishermen because... They had not been schooled in the traditions and erroneous customs of their time. Mm -hmm. What does that tell you about learning and unlearning? Mm -hmm. It's a lot harder to unlearn something that you really believed in the past than it is to learn something new if it, that happens to fit with what you already know. Mm -hmm. You can add something on to your paradigm, that's not a big deal. But if someone says, tear that paradigm apart, I'm going to start, we're going to start all over, oh boy. That is hard. That is very hard. So Jesus chose people who hadn't been, guys who had been, when they were kids, they were out helping dad fish on the Sea of Galilee. They didn't have time to go to school. They were men of native ability, and they were humble and teachable, men whom he could educate for his work. In the common walks of life, that would be us, right? There is many a man and woman patiently treading the round of daily toil, unconscious that he or she possesses powers which, if called into action, would raise him or her to an equality with the world's most honored men. The touch of a skillful hand is needed to arouse those dormant faculties. What could God do with you? I'm asking you out there, what could God do with you if you just gave him a chance? It was such men that Jesus called to be his co-laborers, and he gave them the advantage of association with himself. Now, of course, that would be the key, wouldn't it? Yeah. Never had the world's great men such a teacher. They were no longer ignorant and uncultured. 
they had become like him in mind and character, and men took knowledge of them they had been, that they had been with Jesus. And remember where, that, where, where was it? Where did that, those words said, where were those words said? You remember? Yeah, they, when they were told not to preach in the, the Peter, et and all that. Peter is standing before the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the, of the Jews, and they, it's just, they've just been told, don't ever mention the name of Jesus again. And what does he say? He just goes on and says, what, what, what do you think? Should, I, should, we, should we listen to you or should we listen to God? Yeah. And they went out. They said, take these guys out. We, have, we, have, we need to talk this over. And we, this is, these are words from the Sanhedrin. You know what? These may be ignorant fishermen, <laughs> but, but they spent time with Jesus. They spent time with Jesus. Desire of Ages 249 and 250. Paul, who joined them after the stoning of Stephen, was by far the best educated among them. But what really mattered in their case was that they gathered together, they prayed, they confessed their sins and faults to each other, and they repented of their selfish attitudes, then barriers were broken down, and then they were prepared for Pentecost. Notice something very interesting there. Acts 1, 12 to 15. Then the apostles went back to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives, which is about a kilometer away from the city. They entered the city and went up to the room where they were staying. Peter, John, James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James, son of a faith. Of Phaethius, Simon the Patriot, and Judas, son of James. They gathered frequently to pray as a group, together with the women, and with Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. I if want to interrupt there for a second. Okay. When did they get in this picture? Do you remember what we learned earlier about the, the Mary and, and the brothers of Jesus? One time, up in Galilee, they were so concerned that Jesus was just, I mean, the huge crowds were following him. And he, was, he, was, he hardly had a chance to sleep at night because of all the demands were put on him. And they thought he was going crazy. They, were, they, were, they showed up there and said, you know, Jesus, you should do this. I mean, they, they tried to say to Jesus, you should do this. Follow our instructions. We'll tell you what to do. And what did Jesus say? When he was informed that his mother and his brothers were outside wanting to talk to him, he says, Look at my disciples here. They're my mother and my brothers. Yeah. And now look at them. A few days, go ahead, finish it up. A few days later, there was a meeting of the believers, about 120 in all, and Peter stood up to speak. Okay, so now there's the number 120 I mentioned earlier. So some people think that when the, when, when, at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came down, it might have involved all of these 120 people more than just the 11 disciples. We don't know, but we, we already saw that a little while later, the Holy Spirit came down on 5,000. One of the puzzling questions about what happened on the day of Pentecost is where they could possibly have gathered in a room or space large enough to accommodate thousands of people. Wow. How many rooms were there big enough to accommodate thousands of people in Jerusalem in Jesus' time? I think they would have to be outside, wouldn't they? Yeah, there were two it. places actually that could have could have accommodated them. Yeah, I was just thinking when you see the archaeological things that they find, the building plans those days, except for very wealthy people or governments like Rome that had money, things were pretty small mostly. Yeah. Well, they 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 met in the temple courtyard. Mm. Believe it or not, many people don't know this. But a short distance from the temple courtyard, there was a horse racing track that would have been big enough to, for thousands of people to meet there. Okay. Hippo, in those days, it was called a hippodrome. So it wasn't necessarily a room. It was an no. area. I, I, there were no rooms big enough. Yeah. Closed-in rooms. They, they, there was a, a long line of porches on one side of the temple courtyard. So the, the disciples, whoever was preaching, was, was probably inside of that partly covered area, but the people, a thousand people, no way they could get in there. No, no possible way. 
Well, and why did the brothers and mother of Jesus suddenly join the group? Were they accepted by the disciples? If you had been one of those disciples at that point in time, try to imagine how you would have told the story of Jesus. The witness of the apostles was presented not in their own strength, but in the power, excuse me, in a power they could never have in, engendered within themselves. There was the emerging of the divine spirit. There was the, the energizing. Energizing, excuse me. Of the divine energizing spirit. Of the it's a commentary on Acts 4.33 from our Bible commentary. When the disciples finally left Jerusalem and began to spread out, they went from Jerusalem to Western Europe and as far as India. They went down into Africa and up at least as far north as northern Turkey. Try to imagine how it would have impacted the people in all those different areas to have a stranger show up and be able to speak perfectly in the people's language. And churches were planted everywhere they went. In fact, there were, through a dream, Paul was led to carry the gospel into Europe for the first time. It is possible that some of the Jews who learned about Christianity at Pentecost or some later occasion at Jerusalem may have been already starting up churches in Rome uh, and other such places. But Paul specifically said that he wanted to start churches in places where the gospel had not yet been preached. Why do you suppose he made that choice? I think he liked the challenge. Yeah, and he felt like he wasn't worthy to go belong and work alongside somebody else. He said, considering what I did to the church back in the beginning, I need to struggle in the, in the toughest places. Don't you wish you, ha you had the stories of the evangelistic efforts of all the other disciples and apostles? Were they as remarkable as the stories of Paul, which we have preserved for us in the Bible, including in, in the book of Acts? Is there any reason to think that the Holy Spirit has lost his ambition, motivation, and power to witness? Do you really believe that if you opened the door and began to witness to someone that the Holy Spirit would, sta would stand with you? Why not? What barriers do you perceive that might keep you from, your, from witnessing? Have you ever tried to witness without requesting the special help of the Holy Spirit? Now that would be foolish, wouldn't it? Do you think that the Holy Spirit would be willing to use you? It, there's lots of, I mean, the Bible is full of things about witnessing and all kinds of prob, uh, uh, promises from God. He's just asking for us to do our small part. He said, I want to use your mouth, I want to use your feet, I want to use your arms to carry the gospel. Let's pray. Our kind and wonderful Father, what a privilege it is we have to be your messengers. May we find, may we learn ways to allow ourselves to be used by you, to speak your word, to have the privilege of, of being your partner. And think of the joy that would bring to us for the rest of eternity if we had the opportunity to bring someone else to heaven, to, to, to become a Christian and thus be brought to heaven and to share the, the good news with them forever. It's hard to imagine what a joy that would be. May we have a privilege of doing it is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah.